Today I'm going to be talking about what the idea of surplus means in classical and Marxist political economy. You often hear people talking about the surplus product, surplus labour, surplus value, if you take any interest in political economy. I'm going to try and explain in this talk how this works at two levels, at the level of physical surplus and at the level of surplus value. Consider a simple economy, which I'm showing using an input-output table, which is a didactic tool I use in a lot of these talks. We have two industries, a coal industry and an iron industry. The coal industry produces seven units of coal, using up two units of coal and one unit of iron. The iron industry produces three units of iron, using one unit of iron as tools and three units of coal to fire its furnaces. If we look across the iron, the coal row here, we see that a total of five units are used. Two in the coal industry itself and three in the iron industry. Since the coal industry produced seven units, that means there's a net output of two units. If we do the same thing for the iron industry, we find that there's a gross output of three units. And if we take away the two that are used, there's a net output of one. In this case, there are only two industries and they're producing a physical net product or a physical surplus for those two industries. But what about labour? You clearly can't have an industry without some labour going into it. And if there's going to be labour going into it, people have to be fed. So you need at least one on other industry here, which I'm calling the corn industry. It can stand in for all consumer goods industries. So we now have a bigger input tab tab output table, coal, iron and corn. The corn industry feeds back on itself and we have these labels, department one, department two, etc. What, what do we mean by them? Well, department one is the term that Marx used to describe those industries that produce means of production. So in this case, department one would be the coal and the iron industry. Department two is the set of industries that produce consumer goods. In this case, I've shown it just as producing corn. Now, it produces corn, but has to use up some seed corn to produce the corn. So it, it outputs four units of corn, uses up one unit, so has a net output of three units of corn. Some of this goes as a real wage. Some of the output goes as a real wage. I'm assuming the, the workers are consuming 0 0.3 units of coal and 2 units of corn. So they're kept warm and they're able to eat. And this leaves over a surplus which the upper class consumes. In, here, in this case they get 1.2 units of coal and 1 unit of corn. So another way of looking at this is instead of looking at it as, as a table, you look at it as what in 
computer terminology is called a directed graph. A directed graph is shown as a series of circles with arcs or lines going between them. So department one produces a lot of output that goes back into department one. And the amount that has to be fed back or used up to reproduce department one determines the scale of the physical surplus product that department one can produce. This is purely technically determined. You may think this is a, a negligible thing uh, to consider, but let's take a, an industry of the future, the thermonuclear power industry. The big struggle in the development of thermonuclear power is to have a thermonuclear power reactor that actually produces more electricity than is used to operate it. So the big struggle is to actually get a physical surplus product. The power industry is part of department one and if we're going to move off fossil fuels we're going to have to need to move probably to thermoelectric thermonuclear power and the big struggle is to get a physical surplus product there. This feedback ratio in department one is also crucial for determining the maximum possible rate of industrialization. The amount of physical surplus you have from department one depend, determines how much can be reinvested to build up industry and for the economy to grow when it's industrialising. This is obviously very crucial for the growth of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union's growth plans from the 1920s on were based on trying to get a high ratio of the output of Department 1 fed back into Department 1 to enable an exponential growth rate. The surplus from Department 1 is also crucial in determining how big Department 2 or the consumer goods industry can become. Now I said we can look at it as a directed graph. Well we can put in the other departments here. You have Department 1 using up part of its own output but producing a surplus which flows into Department 2. Department 2 produces an output which goes into the reproduction of labour power. And the reproduction of labour power then causes labour to go into Department 1 and Department 2. However, a portion of the surplus, the physical surplus, from Department 1 and Department 2 ends up going as elite consumption. Now, in all of these flows here, I'm talking about physical flows flows of real goods between these departments. Now I show some means of production going into elite consumption. Well why is that? It's because there was iron left over in that table. You may not have noticed it. But if we take the net product of departments 1 and 2 what I call the basic economy here. The basic economy is Department 1, Department 2 and the reproduction of labour power. And this produces the surplus that the elite consume. Now there is a surplus of iron there, there is also a surplus of coal which is not unaccounted for. There is half a unit of coal and half a unit of iron left over. Well, what happens to that? Well, this is a very simple economy I'm showing you. Not much different from what you had in the days of feudalism. And what did the feudal elite consume a large part of their surplus as? They consumed it as the surplus iron as armour and swords. And they consumed the surplus charcoal to, to fuel the, these armourers. 
if we look at this in table form, I put in another industry, swords and armour, which is using up the surplus, half a unit of coal, half a unit of iron, two units of labour, and it produces an output, one unit worth of swords, which the upper class consume. None of that feeds back into the basic economy. This is a very important point. No surplus can be produced outside the basic economy. The elite goods sector is unproductive. It consumes the surplus labour power and surplus means of production produced in the basic economy. Now I'm showing that in a reconstruction medieval village, but the same thing holds true. No surplus can be produced outside the basic economy. The elite goods sector, which includes arms production, is unproductive. It still consumes the surplus labour and surplus means of production produced in the basic economy. This basic point is still true. It doesn't change as you move from feudalism to capitalism. Now, up until now, I've been talking about everything in physical terms. So what's the difference between a surplus product and surplus value? Well, given this physical table here, this is all in physical units. And given that there is a row made up of labour there, you can integrate the labour contents. This, this spreadsheet itself is doing that. This spreadsheet is calculating the per unit value on the assumption that one unit of labour produces one pound. Now, given the per unit value we can get the total value of the output of each industry. Now, obviously, these individual pounds are ridiculous. You want to be millions of pounds, but or billions of pounds. This simple method of integrating labour coefficients actually will give you a final value for outputs that shows a 98% correlation with actual monetary measures, if you take real input output kit tables, you get 97 to 98% correlations. So this is what actually happens. How, how can we convert this into the kinds of value accounts that Marx deals with in his straightforward um, presentations? In volume two of Capital, he uses these sort of input-output table formulations. But in volume one of Capital, he just uses the monetary units. So we've got the value of a unit of uh, coal, iron, corn, etc. in this row. We have the total values which I got from the last table. We know what the worker's physical consumption is. This is what's necessary to reproduce labour power. If you then express this in money by multiplying 0.3 by that, 0.2 by that, and adding them all up, sorry, 2 by that, and adding them all up, you get 6.29 for variable capital. Do the same thing for upper class consumption, and you get a, a value, a number for surplus value. And Look at the total productive consumption, productive consumption of coal, iron and corn. And you get the total constant capital in money terms. See there. And from these two values, V and S, you can obtain what Marx calls the rate of exploitation. In this case, it's 125%. Comes out to a nice fat figure, which was just coincidental. The 
the value form is just a form of representation of the physical surplus product. There is a physical surplus product being produced and if we translate that into value, that is to say we m measure the physical surplus product in money units, these money units are themselves just the indirect representation of the labour used to make the surplus product. And we know that because of this 98% correlation which exists. What's the advantage of using these different forms? Well, I've given you three columns here corresponding to the three different ways of looking at the surplus. In terms of physical surplus, what you get is what is a vector of numbers. So much corn, so much coal, so much iron, etc. And this is a concrete way of looking at it. If we do it in terms of money, we get a scalar number. We get a total amount of surplus value in the economy measured in pounds. And this is an abstract way of representing the same information. Now, although the concrete form of the surplus product is very useful for a socialist economy doing economic planning, it doesn't enable you to measure an exploitation rate because you can't take a ratio of two vectors. You have to translate them into two scalars first. So the money surplus does enable you to measure the, the exploitation rate. Now the labour surplus is also a scalar. It's a total number of hours. It's abstract because we've lost the details about how the labour was expended once we've done that. And yes, it can be used to measure the exploitation rate. On the other hand, these things look the same. They're scalar, both scalars, both abstract, both measure the exploitation rate. But the money surplus is mystified because it hides the actual human social activity which lies behind it. Whereas the labor, measuring it in terms of surplus labor brings to light the actual human activity that lies behind all this. Socialist theory is important. We need strong arguments to be developed and popularized. I'm trying with these videos to do that. If you sympathize, please share these videos on social media, organize socialist study circles, and intervene in political groups with the sorts of arguments presented in these talks. You should read up. You should study classical socialism. You should read Marx. You should start with wages, prices and profit. You should start study circles to read capital. The modern socialist arguments in my videos are presented in more detail in books I've collaborated on. Towards a New Socialism, which gives a compre comprehensive theory of how socialism will work, how planning will work, how pay will work, how to create social equality, foreign trade policy and lots of other things. Arguments for Socialism gives arguments for why socialism is better, why de de direct democracy is better than representative democracy, and why Mises was wrong in his arguments against socialism. Future socialism is going to rely heavily on the use of computer technology and automation. This book is an account of computation from a Marxist materialist philosophical standpoint, why it's possible and why computation is bounded by the laws of physics. The last book is more advanced. It presupposes a certain knowledge of political economy and of 
modern science, but what it does is show how the Marxist theory of exploitation, the Marxist theory of value, and the Marxist theory of money are all based ultimately on the laws of statistical mechanics and how they arise as emergent effects of immutable physical laws.